Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. He's risen indeed. Hi, it's lovely to see you this yeah. Easter morning. We're so glad to welcome you to our Easter celebration on this Resurrection Sunday. And just a reminder, and I, I think Mike is going to be putting it up on screen shortly. Um, we have communion today, so if you want to join us for communion, please make sure you've got some bread and some juice or wine ready for that. And uh, yes, it, we, we've got a lot packed in. I'm going to move over because that's in the way. Uh, we've got a lot packed into this service today, a lot for you to, to see. Our worship team have um, been putting together some songs especially for today and we hope that you will really enjoy this morning the joy of Easter and I'm going to hand over right away now to Ernie. Good morning everyone and a very happy Easter to you all. I greet you with the words that Christ has died, Christ is risen and Christ will come again. Perhaps even better described by these words from 1 Peter 1 and verse 3, which is headed praise to God for a living hope. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we lift our hearts to you. And as this day begins. May we carry this unity that we share into every moment, knowing that we are one with the risen Christ. Lord, we lift our eyes to you on this wonderful morning and ask that this moment stay with us, reminding us to look for the promise in your word. And Lord, we lift our prayers to you. May we take in all this morning means and know that you sustain us, that you keep us, and you work within us always. And so we lift our voices to you. We celebrate the greatest day in history when Jesus rose from death, defeated darkness, and bathed the world in a stunning resurrection light. Lord, accept, we pray, the praise that we offer in the name of Jesus Christ, the Saviour of the world. Amen. What a morning, gloriously bright, with the dawning of hope in Jerusalem. Oh, did the grave goes tomb filled with light, as the angels announced Christ is risen. See God's salvation plan, Lord in love, Lord in pain. Made him sacrifice, fulfilled in Christ the man, for he lives, Christ is risen from the dead. See Mary weeping, where is he laid? As in sorrow she turns from the empty tomb, hears a voice speaking, calling her name. It's the Master, the Lord, raised to life again. The voice that spans the years, speaking life, stirring hope, bringing peace to us. Will sound till he appears, for he lives, Christ is risen from the dead. One with the Father, ancient of days, through the Spirit who grows faith with certainty. Honor and blessing, Lord. 
glory and praise to the King crowned with power and authority. And we are raised with him, death is dead, love is one, Christ is conquered. And we shall reign with him, for he lives, Christ is risen from the dead. What a morning, gloriously bright, with the dawning of hope in Jerusalem. Folded the grave, closed tomb filled with light, as the angels announced Christ is risen. See God's salvation plan, wrought in love, born in pain. Made in sacrifice, fulfilled in Christ the man, for he lives, Christ is risen from the dead. my mind to Calvary where Jesus fled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance in by heavy snow, Messiah still, and all is Oh, praise the name of the Lord. the break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again, oh trampled death, where is your sin? The angels roar for Christ the King, oh praise the shall return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face oh praise the name of the Lord our God oh praise his name for
Well, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for today, for this Easter day. We thank you for all the opportunities it brings to us. And Lord, how we praise you. We praise you that you sent your only son, Jesus Christ, that we might be reconciled to you. And when we think of this world of ours, of all its troubles, with its hurt, its suffering and its fears, we see such a need for reconciliation. For reconciliation amongst all those countries that are torn apart by war. We pray, Lord, that your light will shine in all the darkest areas of this earth. And Lord, we, we pray for evangelists and missionaries and for those who labour to tell the good news of the gospel of Jesus to people all around this world. Especially today, Lord, may they be strengthened by our prayers. And Lord, we ask that we too will not be afraid to speak out boldly in your name. And we think too of the families of this country, of this world, who are torn apart and are so in need of reconciliation. For whatever reason, they may have drifted apart. Lord, we pray today that they'll consider your love. Lord, that they'll know the need to put aside pride and to unite back together again. We pray for reconciliation this morning. And Lord, we ask too, as things start to open up across this country of ours, that people stick to the rules and that they don't do things that they shouldn't, however tempted they might be. And we think of our doctors and we pray for them. We pray for our nurses and our NHS workers, our care workers. Surround them with your protection, we pray. And for all those in essential services, for those involved in delivering goods, for shopkeepers, for all those everywhere in the front line. And we pray for our teachers and for our students. And Lord, we pray for our church leaders everywhere. Give them your wisdom and surround them with your love, we pray. Help them to trust you more. And we pray for our community here in Gatehouse. We thank you for all the work that's being done by TGB for its leaders, its volunteers. Continue to give them your wisdom, we pray. And we thank you for our church. And Lord, we ask you that you guide us with your wisdom and knowledge in the weeks ahead. Unite us and bind us with your love as we seek your will, we pray. And Lord, we think of the food bank and all those who are involved in that, and we thank you. And Lord, as we look to Easter, help us, we pray, to reflect the true meaning of this occasion and bring us all closer to you. And we think, Lord, of the lost. We think of the hurting and the lonely and we pray for every one of them, for the bereaved and for those who feel imprisoned, perhaps behind invisible bars and walls. But Lord, we ask you send your comfort and your calming presence to those who feel they are without hope, for those who are perhaps suffering mentally, for those who are suffering financially. Lord, protect the defenceless and hold them close to your heart, we pray. Lord, we pray for everyone who's suffering in this world, perhaps because of racism, perhaps by sadness, perhaps by loneliness, and those who live in fear of their very lives, who live in fear of famine and disease. And so, Lord, we pray for the world leaders and for all our leaders here in the UK for a peace and an understanding among them, that your wisdom may shine through all they do. And Lord, you love this world so much that you gave your one and only Son, that we might be called your children too. Lord, help us to live in the gladness and grace of Easter Sunday every day. Help us to walk in your mighty grace with hearts full of thankfulness, and to tell your good news to the world. In Jesus' name. Amen.
my heart is filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pain, who clung the depths of my disgrace and gave me life again, who crushed my curse of sinfulness and clothed me with his light and drove his lore of righteousness with power upon my heart My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who walks beside, who floods my weaknesses with strength and causes fears to fly, whose every promise is in the for every step I take, sustaining me with arms of love and crowning me with grace. Every thought is love For every day I have on earth Is given by the King So I will give my life, my all To love and follow Him gave me life again, who crushed my curse of sinfulness and clothed me with his light and drove his lore of righteousness with power upon my heart. For every day I have on earth is given by the King, so I will give my life, my own, to love and to follow Him. Thank you, Ernie, for leading us in that first part of the service. As we were reminded at the beginning, this time last year, we were still trying to get our heads around the COVID-19 pandemic. And the governments of the world reacted in a number of different ways. Some believed what they heard about the risks and acted immediately to introduce the measures necessary to protect their population. Emergency lockdowns followed, travel restrictions and border controls. Others were too slow to act and their inaction and delay cost lives. 
Some governments and many individuals didn't believe it was real. Others couldn't believe or refused to believe and the rest, as they say, is history. Maybe they thought it was much ado about nothing. No need to panic. It would pass. No point wasting time and energy on it. Too many other priorities. We can't let a mere virus disrupt life or inconvenience us for something that will probably just go away. But due to their unbelief and their inaction, more people perished than needed to. Around the world, thousands more lives have been lost that would have been saved if national governments and individuals had taken things more seriously. What was needed more than anything else was belief, followed by action. As we shall hear this morning, it was much the same on that first resurrection morning. One of the disciples believed without seeing. Others believed when they heard, and still others when they saw. And there was one man there who refused to believe until he could see and touch the risen Lord Jesus with his very own hands. Listen now as Fiona reads to us from John 20. John 20 verses 1 to 8. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. As we sung earlier, oh, what a morning that was. It was a dark Sunday morning when Mary Magdalene discovered the empty grave and went running to tell Peter and John, the writer of this account. Mary told them that they had taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. Peter and John responded quickly to the news and went running to the tomb. John was the fastest runner and got there first, but took a bit of time to take stock of what he saw without actually entering the tomb. But always the man of action. As soon as Peter arrived at the tomb, there was no holding him back. He was straight in there. And you can imagine he was probably totally stunned at what he saw in that tomb. The strips of linen that he knew Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea had so carefully wrapped Jesus in before laying him to rest were just lying there. And the cloth that they had wrapped around his head was empty, but still in place. Then in verse 8, John went in, in, went in too, and he tells us that he saw and believed. Verse 9 says that they still didn't understand. But even though John didn't have the whole picture, he believed. He realised that just as he said he would, Jesus had somehow defeated death. So some don't physically see, but are able to work things out because they've been paying attention. What about you? Do you know God's word well enough to believe in Jesus when you see the evidence? Secondly, there are those who believe when they hear. Listen now as Shaz reads some more of John 20. This morning's reading is from John, chapter 20, starting to read from verse 11 
Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. Now Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realise that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. As we've heard, Mary Magdalene was the first to discover something odd had happened at the tomb. And it looks very much like after she'd run to fetch Peter and John, she made her way back there. Whether or not she arrived while they were still there is unclear. But if they were, they apparently left her as they went back to the place where they were staying. And in verse 11, we find that she stood outside the tomb crying. Mark and Luke both tell us that the women had gone to the tomb with spices to anoint Jesus' body. Presumably in the haste to bury him before sunset on a Friday evening, this normal part of the burial ritual was missed. Despite John telling us in a previous chapter that Nicodemus had in fact provided the necessary spices and perfume. And Luke tells us that the women had taken the spices and perfumes home with them to prepare in order to anoint the body after the Sabbath rest. So as Mary Magdalene stood weeping outside the tomb, it would seem that her main concern was that if they, whoever they were, had taken Jesus' body away, she wouldn't be able to anoint him. She'd got up early and made her way there in the dark, especially to do this. No wonder she was a bit emotional. She bent down to see just what had happened in the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the, the other at the feet. In this amazing sequence of events, the angels asked her why she was crying. And she told them, they have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have put him. Then, as she turned around, she saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognise him. Just like the angels, he asked her why she was crying, and then who she was looking for. She thought he might be a gardener, and asked him if he had moved the body. Please, could he tell her where he'd put it? At that, Jesus addressed her by name, and she immediately exclaimed, Rabboni. She might not have recognised him standing there in the garden, but she knew his voice. John believed by seeing, and Mary Magdalene believed by hearing. Since that day, when according to Luke 8 and verse 2, Jesus had cured Mary of evil spirits and diseases, she had become a close follower of his. She knew his voice. And on this momentous morning, hearing his voice was all she needed to believe. In John 10, Verse 27, we heard Jesus refer to those who follow him as his sheep. And he was very clear that his sheep listen to his voice. So what about you? Is he your Lord? Do you follow him closely enough to know his voice when you hear it? My first experience of a Pentecostal church was Beth Shan in Newcastle. 
I worked in care homes at the time and could seldom make it to my local church on a Sunday. So I travelled the 20 miles to, to Newcastle on a Thursday night. And at Bethshan, the place was packed. You see, they had a real thirst for God's word. And they really knew his voice. Often at those meetings, somebody would go up to the pastor and whisper something in his ear. And he'd give them the mic and they would share what they believed God was showing them. Sometimes it was a word of encouragement for the whole church. But what made a lasting impression on me was how often those words spoke directly into the individual life of someone sitting there. And sometimes, a week or two later, we would hear their testimony of how that word had spoken to them in very specific circumstances that the person who brought the word couldn't possibly have known about. As we gathered each Thursday evening, we had a hunger for God's word. And for the first time in my life, I realised just how much God still speaks through his Holy Spirit. It's seldom audible, more of an inner voice, sometimes just speaking to us individually. Other times it's a word to share with someone else or with the church. And it's always consistent with God's written word, prompting and revealing more of his will and purpose to us. How important is it to you to hear God's voice? Are you prepared to make time to spend in his presence? Or are you too busy? Are you satisfied with all the other voices which compete for your attention when you're not listening to God? So there are some who don't physically see but believe anyway because they've been attentive to God's word. There are some who believe because they recognise the voice of the Lord. And thirdly, there are some who can only believe when they see things with their own eyes. Listen now as Sheila reads verses 19 and 20 and then she'll skip forward to verses 24 to 29. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Now Thomas called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. When the other disciples told him that they had seen the Lord, he declared, Unless I see the nail marks in, in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came in and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas answered, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So this section begins on a Sunday evening when the disciples were together with the doors locked and Jesus appeared. He showed them his hands and side, and John tells us that the disciples were overjoyed when they saw 
the Lord. They say that seeing is believing, and one of the modern wonders of the world is the Milor Viaduct over the Tarn Valley in the south of France. At 1,104 feet high, it's the tallest bridge in the world. I'd read about it. I'd seen it on the telly. But when I heard that we would be staying not too far away from it, I wanted to see it for myself. And Alison and I had a wonderful day trip to see it. We drove over it. We drove under it. We took photos of it. Like hundreds of other people, we went to the visitor center, which told the story of how it had been built. I'm not sure if Alison even understood why I wanted to see the viaduct, but by the time we'd both seen it, we were both pretty awestruck. Despite all I'd heard and read about it, I wasn't quite prepared for the impact of actually seeing it. And it was only then that I was truly able to appreciate that awesome feat of engineering. What a privilege it was for those first disciples to meet and eat with the risen Lord Jesus, not just once, but several times to see for themselves. And because of the impact of that awesome experience on their lives, we are left in no doubt at all as to the truth of the resurrection. But then, there are the Thomases of this world. As we've heard, one man believed the good news without even seeing Jesus. A woman believed when she heard his voice. And even more believed when they saw. But Thomas wasn't there. And no amount of witness accounts was going to convince him of the resurrection. Before he could believe, he needed to see Jesus and touch him with his very own hands. And one of the most reassuring things about this resurrection account is the way in which Jesus then went out of his way to accommodate Thomas's need to see and touch. He had a whole week of unbelief before one day they were gathered together in the house. The doors were locked, but verse 26 tells us that somehow Jesus came and stood among them. And he clearly knew exactly what Thomas had said and what he needed to see and do. Because the risen Lord Jesus said to him, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it inside my side. Stop doubting and believe. And boy, did he believe. And he said, my Lord. And my God. Jesus told Thomas that he had believed because he had seen. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And that's us, isn't it? I don't hear any criticism or judgment in what Jesus said to Thomas. He went out of his way to help him to believe and in doing so offered a promise to all who would in future come to belief without seeing for themselves. You see, what matters most to Jesus is that we believe. He was so very concerned about that and about unbelief. And John explains in verse 31 that what he has written in this gospel account is in order for us to continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing we would have life by the power of his name. It didn't actually matter in the end how any of them reached that point of belief. What mattered was that they did believe. Jesus had stressed the importance of belief many times before. Whoever believes in me 
will also do the works that I do. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Some of us grew up hearing about Jesus and never really questioned what we heard. We had no problem believing. To others, it was just a story, and it was some years later before it really all began to make sense. Others grew up hardly ever hearing about Jesus, and then maybe at a time of personal searching, or maybe because of the witnesses, the witness of others, they came to believe later in life. Others remain sceptical. They've heard about Jesus, but really don't believe or see any relevance for modern life. But just like he did with Thomas, Jesus wants to meet each and every person right where they are. He wants to meet you where you are. He wants to, his main concern, his, his concern for, is for those who don't yet believe and he will go out of his way to do that, to respond to you as an individual. But be sure of one thing, he'll never force himself onto anyone. In Revelation 3 and verse 20, he says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. One of the most striking things about all of those who believed is that none of them really understood. Belief was still an act of faith which took them beyond any kind of rational process of thinking. As we've seen already, John told us that they still didn't understand. Understanding came later. I have known too far too many people who have denied themselves the relationship Jesus offers them because they've been too rational about it. And they've left him knocking at the door. They haven't even bothered to open it, let alone let Jesus come into their lives. I like the story of a group of university undergraduates having a bar lunch who noticed that the salt and pepper were in the wrong pots. As only students can, there followed a complicated discussion about how, using the few items at their disposal, they could transfer the salt and pepper into their own pots without spilling them on the table. Eventually, they came up with a plan involving a straw, a beer mat, and a serviette. And when the witness came across, uh, when the waitress came across, they shared with her their brainwave. She promptly reached down and swapped over the lids. Looking at the student, she said, sorted. The Easter message is simple and uncomplicated. Jesus died for the sins of the world. And then he rose again. Jesus died for the sins of the world. And then he rose again. It's that straightforward. And when you simply believe it for yourself and take the necessary actions, you open the door to Jesus and to things that will totally change your whole outlook on life and give you the hope of eternity. The tragedy is that those who fail to believe and take this simple message seriously are just like the COVID sceptics I spoke about at the beginning, the conspiracy theorists and doubters 
who saw no need to act, and as a result, so many more perished than ever needed to. Which brings us finally to the most famous verse of all about belief. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not have should not perish but have eternal life do you believe that this easter morning do you believe that the power that raised jesus from the grave is still at work and if you do have you taken the necessary action and chosen to let him be Lord and God. Or have you heard it all before, but never really taken it that seriously? Or do you kind of believe, but still haven't done anything about it? Maybe you decided to put it off until later. Or perhaps you thought it was much ado about nothing, no need to panic, no point wasting time and energy on it when you, when you have too many other priorities in your life. Maybe you think that in the big scheme of things, it doesn't matter that much. And yet, and yet, actually, it matters more than anything else. Belief is the only way to eternal life. Whatever you do, don't act too slowly. You may end up leaving it too late. Believe in Jesus. Believe in the resurrected Lord Jesus who we celebrate today. Why not make this Easter the day you first believe? Shall we pray? Oh, Father God, we thank you for setting your son, Jesus. We thank you that you sacrificed his life for us. Just as we will be remembering in a few minutes as we celebrate communion together. Oh, thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your obedience, even unto death. Father God, we may not completely understand, but we believe in faith that you did this for us. That in some way, through sacrificing Jesus on that cross, you dealt with our sins once and for all. And Father, we now come to you in belief. I'm going to ask Micah now to put up a wee prayer in front of us. And I would invite you just to say this prayer with me this morning. Father, I believe you. Father, I believe you. Jesus, I receive you. Jesus, I receive you. Holy Spirit, I now free you. Holy Spirit, I now free you. Create in me new life. Create in me new life. We're now going to sing another song and then Alison is going to share communion with us.
and then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know Sharing communion is very important to me. It's an emotional act and deeply symbolic. Reading Exodus recently reminded me that communion has its roots in the Passover. A sacrifice had to be made and houses were marked with the blood of a lamb. Um, they were spared by the angel of death if they had that mark. And following this in the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, Moses urged his people to remember what God had done, and what they'd been through, and what was still to come. The Old Testament tells us a lot about sin offerings, particularly in Leviticus, and the animals which had to be slaughtered for their blood. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we are set free from the Old Testament and its ceremonial laws. Instead, we now remember our own Passover lamb, the Lamb of God, who on the first Good Friday made atonement for our sins. He shed his blood for us. We're told that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus told us to remember this, that he'd shed his blood for us in order to take away our sins and spare us from the penalty of death. It was a huge sacrifice, which even though he knew would be horrendous and agonizing, he chose that his father's will be done. He did this for each and every one of us who believes in him that he died for us, but was raised from the dead. It feels individual and makes me feel like even if I were the only person in the world, he would still have done it just for me. And how humbled I feel to think that he chose to die for me. Jesus was the great high priest and as such was the perfect sacrifice, completely holy. There was no sin in him. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit and totally dedicated to his, his heavenly father's service. How amazing that Jesus set me free from the old law. He's forgiven me. He's rescued me. He has saved me. We are told to share communion. During the Last Supper, Jesus broke the bread gave thanks, gave it to the disciples, and then said, do this in remembrance of me. Communion is a profound ritual of gratitude. As we remember the last meal Jesus took with his best friends before submitting to death on the cross, we remember his words. 
As we take communion, we meditate on his great sacrificial love and his death, personal for each one of us. We are recipients of his forgiveness, his mercy, his grace and his favour. Because our sins are forgiven, we are made righteous in his sight and can therefore enjoy direct relationship with God and know the hope of all his promises. Thank you, Alison, for that. Let's just take a few moments to honestly examine ourselves before we share the bread and drink from the cup. So the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's share the bread. And remember his body given for us. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. Let's share the blood shed for you and for many. you thank you father god for giving your son for us thank you jesus for dying for us for your willingness to become our savior it's so awesome to think that you were willing to do this for us and this Easter morning, as we look to that empty cross, we cry out with praise and thanksgiving. An empty cross, an empty grave. And our Lord Jesus, seated at the throne of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. And now we're going to sing Thine be the glory.
massive thank you to all who have participated in today's service. People have been so fantastic the way that they have sent these little video clips across for us to make these service and a massive thank you to, to Micah for all he does with these clips to bring them together so that we can actually enjoy worship together like this week by week. So all that remains for me to do now is to wish you a very happy Easter enjoy the rest of the day and if anyone wishes to speak to me about anything that has been said in this service or any other service for that matter if there's anything more that you'd like to know if you'd like things explained a little bit more we have um booklets we can give you but i'm very happy to sit down and have a chat with you on the phone as well or to answer any questions so please don't be slow to come forward i wouldn't want any want to go away having questions and doubts I would much rather you come and ask the questions so let's just say together the words of the grace the grace, grace of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ and the love, love of God, God and the, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Spirit be with us all evermore, evermore. Amen, Amen.